Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Reka Navarat, and our guest today is Max Bennett, AI entrepreneur and neuroscience researcher. Our main topic will be a book he published in the autumn of 2023, A Brief History of Intelligence, Why the Evolution of the Brain Holds the Key to the Future of AI. It introduces the history of nervous systems using a unique and technology-inspired framework. So in this conversation, we will hear both about the capabilities of animals 500 million years ago and about the capabilities of some cutting-edge AI systems. Max, thanks so much for this amazing book, and thanks for joining us today. Super excited to be here. Can you perhaps start with introducing yourself and sharing the story, how you came to write A Brief History of Intelligence? Sure. Um, so my name is Max Bennett, as you said. Um, I've spent the bulk of my career working on commercializing AI systems. So um, the first company I co-founded was called Blue Corp. And we pl- applied uh, a ton of machine learning technologies to help really large companies personalize marketing messaging. So we would track sort of anonymous behavioral signals about customer behavior. Um, and what we would try and do is predict what products customers would be interested in, um, uh, how to bundle products together correctly. It was sort of like Amazon product recommendations on steroids. Um, and so, you know, we power email marketing campaigns and, and uh, po- uh, recommendation tools for companies like Nike and CVS and, and other large brands. So I spent most of my career on, on that. And it was always really fascinating um, to observe the sort of perplexing places where AI systems still, you know, this is before our large language models and ChatGPT, but even then, uh, I was very clear uh, that AI systems fell short of things that the human brain could do, um, or I should say, especially then. And so I, I, that was sort of the early kernel of my interest in uh, what is it about the human brain that can do certain things really well and then other things really poorly. And this is, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but classically called Moravec's paradox, where um, it's certain things computers are amazing at, like, you know, computing very large search spaces and doing basic arithmetic very quickly, um, which things uh, are things that the human brain is quite bad at. And there's things that computers are remarkably bad at, like, you know, basic common sense moving around as a, as a robotic body doing the dishes that human brains are really, really good at. And so it's this weird paradox as to why are machines good at some things and bad at others. And so that was sort of the early kernel of my interest um, in the topic of neuroscience. Uh, and uh, I very naively thought that, you know, understanding how the brain works was like an un- as an outsider, I was like, this must be an understood topic. So I'm just going to like read a few textbooks and then I'll walk away with an understanding of what the human brain does that's so unique and special. And of course, in reality, we, we don't know even today really how the brain functions. But the common paradigm in understanding how the brain works is effectively functional decomposition, which is we look at the human brain and we try to break it down into its subsidiary parts um, and assign function to each of these parts. Um, And, you know, that's in some ways a quite unsatisfying framework because uh, the more evidence that rolls in, it just shows that functional decomposition is like a very fuzzy poor even first approximation of how the brain actually works because most functions are distributed across multiple subsystems, et cetera. So through this, I just started sort of collaborating with various neuroscientists over email. Um, and eventually those, some of them sort of, uh, evolved into, you know, uh, more deep collaborations and eventually, uh, many of them friendships. And, you know, we came, I came up with this sort of kernel of an idea that, you know, there's really two ways to simplify how the brain works. One is to decompose it um, into smaller parts, which is challenging. But the other is to sort of roll back time and watch the brain evolve step by step because the brain, the modern human brain was not always this complicated um, and evolution's constrained. So each step is sort of a small iteration on the prior step. And that was sort of the early kernel. We did a bunch of work putting that together. And it was honestly a surprise that when putting that story together, there's a really almost elegant mapping between uh, innovations in artificial intelligence, both ones that we understand well and ones that we know are missing. Um, and so that's sort of the very quick sort of summary of, of the journey towards the book. 
let me continue with this very clear mapping between innovation and technology, because this is the basis also of one of your papers and of the book itself, which uh, uh, introduces evolution and uh, five breakthrough, uh, breakthroughs model. And you compare these breakthroughs uh, to big changes in technology in the sense that there was a new capabil capability and it enabled multiple different applications. And I found this whole idea very fascinating. So can you introduce it a bit more? Yeah, so... so um... So there's this famous concept uh, called like Mars three levels of analysis, um, and it's it's trying to break decompose any entity capable of an intellectual task or computation into three levels of abstraction. At the top is computation, which is sort of you know if you were to map that to psychology, like the cognitive ability that you have, the emergent ability that you can execute. Below that is algorithm. It's mathematically how are you capable of this feat. And then below that's implementation, which is what is the physical uh, mechanism instantiated in atoms and molecules, et cetera, by which this algorithm is implemented. And so I, you know, I was particularly interested in that second level. It wasn't, you know, how neurons implemented this thing that I was interested in. And also I wasn't interested in the emergent capabilities of brains. I wanted to know the underlying mathematical algorithms being implemented that could be sort of... Uh, shifted towards um, something in silica, i.e. I, I, you could do it in artificial intelligence. And what is interesting about this sort of five breakthrough story that emerges when you track the evolution of the brain is many of what psychologists would call maybe behavioral abilities or, or intellectual capacities often emerge from a single underlying algorithm. And this provides a, a very simplified view or a simplifying view um, of uh, the capacities of brains. So for the, I think the simplest to understand example is um, vicarious trial and error, meaning the or, or imagination, the ability to imagine possible futures, episodic memory, meaning the ability to remember past episodic effect, uh, instances of your life, um, and counterfactual learning, meaning being able to learn from actions you did not take. In other words, what the, would the world have looked like had I done something different five seconds ago than what I just did? All three of these are in, can be looked at as separate intellectual capacities, but when you go into the brain and see the underlying neurological mechanisms, what one realizes is they're all emergent from the same exact algorithm. Um, this is an underlying mechanism for simulating external states of the world that's not the current one. If I, if I simulate possible future states, that's uh, planning. That's vicarious trial and error. If I imagine a specific instance of a past event, that's episodic memory. If I imagine a past event and then in my mind's eye take a different action and see the outcome, that's counterfactual learning. And so when we, you know, in general saying that if just by decomposing the human brain is, is not, it's not so trivial to see how those things are the same. Although, um, you know, more modern research in neuroscience is, is revealing that in the human brain. But through the lens of evolution, this becomes even clearer because we see all three of these abilities emerge with early mammals. Um, and we see really only one fundamental neurolog neurobiological modification early mammals, which is the emergence of the neocortex. And these three things are very well, um, you can see a very clear mapping between what the neocortex enables a brain to do and these three abilities. And so that's where you sort of get this really nice mapping between one new breakthrough, in other words, being able to simulate uh, external states of the world that's not the current one, and a whole suite of new abilities that emerge from I can now plan, I can now remember past events, I can now learn through counterfactuals. Um, and this is really nice evolutionarily because um, it seems clear that the, the most, given how complicated the brain is, the most adaptive phenotypes would be ones that uh, modify a small set of things in the brain that lead to many flexible um, uh, uh, new types of behaviors that are adaptive. Um, so, so yeah, so that's like, I think the best example of, of a, of a breakthrough leading to multiple emergent, um, behaviors, but you can see that across all five of them. Yes, actually did, uh, this was the third one, the simulation, yes. which, uh, yep. appeared with the early mammals in the neocortex. And let's go back to the very first one, which is Probably for uh, 
as a surprise for some people, not that cognitive, but it's more about moving around. And this is uh, steering. Can you talk about that breakthrough? Yeah. So, so if we think about sort of the fir- the highest level of Mars's three levels, so the computation before we talk about the underlying algorithm, the very first brains evolved um, with the first bilaterians. Um, so bilateralism is the feature of animals where we are symmetric or p- across a central plane. Um, um, so m- almost all animals today are bilaterally symmetric. Um, this contrasts to things like jellyfish and sea anemones and coral, which are radially symmetric. In other words, symmetric across a central axis. Um, and it is interesting to observe that all animals with brains um, descend from a single bilaterian ancestor in which the very first brain evolved. So brains and bilateral symmetry are sort of two sides of the same coin, at least in terms of the sort of temporal ordering of events. Um, and with the first bilaterians, um, we have very good evidence uh, that the first uh, sort of form of navigation uh, towards food and away from uh, predators evolved. Um, and and we see this in the sense that most uh, animals that predated bilaterians, which we think were probably most akin to today's corals or sea anemones, did not navigate towards food. Um, they were sensile creatures that sat in place and were filter feeding as uh, small food particles would pass, pass them. Um, but with bilaterians, they actually navigated uh, towards food. And so what's what's interesting to observe is these very first animals almost certainly did not have complex sensory organs. Um, and there's a variety of ways we can reverse engineer that. Um, a modern model organism for this is a nematode like C. elegans. There's also planarians, which are another very simple bilaterium. They have no eyes. Um, they can't sort of detect complex frequencies. In other words, uh, detect sounds um, or, or sort of perceive different different types of sounds. Um, they just had a, photo, a few photosensory neurons, so they could detect the brightness of light. They had a few neurons that could detect the presence of certain uh, chemicals in the water. Um, uh, it, I wouldn't even classify that as smell yet. They're just sort of chemosensory neurons, so a single set of molecules would activate a single neuron, which would trigger a behavior. Uh, they had touch neurons, etc. And so when one looks at a nematode navigate towards and away from food, what's interesting uh, to observe is that it does it very successfully despite seeing almost nothing in the world. Um, And so when one analyzes, okay, so the emergent behavior is I can can find food uh, and I can swim away from uh, from predators. Um, uh, What's the underlying algorithm by which it's actually implementing this? Um, And uh, what's going on is something called taxis or taxis navigation. And the way this works is actually exactly how um, bacteria navigate around without really complex sensory organs. Um, and the way it works is uh, you simply have to detect whether the thing you're trying to get closer towards is increasing in concentration. Um, and then you just keep going forward. And if it's decreasing in concentration, you turn randomly. And if you implement this very simple algorithm over enough time, you get to the source of whatever you're, you're pursuing. And this takes advantage of a very simple feature of the physical world which is especially chemicals make gradients. So if you have a food source, what it produces is a smell or chemical gradient where the closer to the source of the the food smell, the higher the concentration of the sort of chemicals that are uh, 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 emerging from that food source. So using that very simple property of the physical world, this remarkably simple algorithm of just keep going forward if the concentration of the good thing is increasing and then turn if it decreases, leads you to be able to find food without seeing much of the world and perceiving much of the world at all. And so we go into the brain of these first uh, nematodes and, and almost certainly the very first bilaterians. Um, what we see is uh, there was no encoding of good or bad things in the deep in the brain of these uh, of these animals. So when, when we see something, when the neurons in our retina activate when we see an object, the neurons in our retina do not directly encode whether or not we think that is a good or a bad thing. Um, that is computed deeper in our brain. But when you look at, an, at a nematode, the neurons that activate in the presence of a food smell are exactly the neurons that trigger forward momentum. In other words, the sensory neurons directly encode the goodness or badness of things. They have a set of neurons that are genetically hard-coded to activate 
by things that the nematode is going to swim towards. And they have another set of neurons that are genetically hard coded to activate and respond to things that the nematode is going to swim away from. So in other words, there's no like complex learning and assessment of valence, which is the word generally used to denote the goodness or badness of things. This is just genetically hard coded into the sensory neurons of some things I swim towards, some things I swim away from. Um, and so with this very first, and so with this very first brain, uh, the underlying algorithm of steering, which I colloquially just call our underlying algorithm of taxis, which I colloquially call steering, um, you get all of these really interesting emergent properties. Um, you get the first form of valence. In other words, the categorization of things in the world into good and bad. You get bilateral symmetry, which was necessary to implement this a system of forward locomotion or turning. Um, you actually get the first version of affective states, which is a primitive version of emotion, um, because uh, the because the world is clumpy. Uh, nematodes that pass food will persistently locally search the area after detecting that food, even if they're not currently smelling food. And so that's implemented through neuromodulatory neurons, where it triggers a release of dopamine, which triggers local pursuit which is a primitive version of an affective state. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a behavioral repertoire triggered by an external stimuli, but persisting beyond it. Um, and we sort of see that template even in nematodes. Um, so the very first brain was, was designed for categorizing the world into good and bad and implementing a very simple algorithm for finding food and avoiding um, predators using uh, that categorization of good and bad. Um, so that was, that was breakthrough number one. And in this break from, breakthrough number one, we also got to know the first way of learning, and that was associative learning. Uh, can you talk a bit about that and how this one relates to this valence and comfort? Yes, comfort? totally. So the, um, in, in a nematode, uh, you can observe um, the tweaking of how good or bad a nematode uh, perceive something to be. Um, so, and so this is implemented through reweighting the connections between these good valence neurons and the motor neurons for forward locomotion or turning. Um, and so for example, you can put a nematode in salt water. Um, and, uh, if you deprive, if you don't put food in the salt water, um, so it's exposed to salt in the presence of hunger, if you put it in another Petri dish after, you know, an hour or so, it'll actually swim away from the salts if you put salts on the other side. Um, alternatively, uh, if you put a worm that's never experienced hunger in the presence of salt in a Petri dish, it'll swim towards the salt. So normally salt is deemed positive valence. Um, if you put nematodes in a Petri dish with salt and food, so equal exposure to salt, but not in the presence of hunger, they still swim towards salt. So what that clearly demonstrates is there's an association and a nematode's brain between the negative valence state of hunger and the stimuli of salt. Um, and you see other simple bilaterians like flatworms um, capable of doing exactly the same thing. Um, so this is the, almost the, the most basic form of associative learning, which is just tweaking how good or bad you find something based on prior experience. Um, and that was presence, and it's, and it's quite clear why that would be highly adaptive. Um, because if you're uh, going to spend energy navigating towards or away from something, uh, you surely want to remember, uh, you know, if you swam in a certain direction and then you never found food there, you want to not swim in that direction again. <laughs> it sounds logical. And there are limitations of this type of learning. So was the temporal one and the credit assignment problem also sounded very logical how you describe it in this first section? Yeah, so the one of the outs, this is where you one starts to see a connection with AI that I find really exciting and, and elegant. Um, so there was, um, probably most listeners have heard of Edward Thorndike. He was a famous uh, behavioral psychologist in the late 1800s. And he did a bunch of studies demonstrating uh, that a large portion of animal learning is trial and error learning. In other words, um, he called this the law of effect. So when some good outcome happens, the recently done behaviors become more likely to occur in the same situation. And if some bad outcome happens, the recently activated behaviors become less likely to happen. And the classic experiment for this 
that at Thorndike did, it, it did is you put some cats in puzzle boxes. So that's just like a, a small little cage. You put some food outside of the puzzle box. And there's a there's a door that opens if the cat performs some set of behavior. Sometimes it's pulling a loop. Sometimes it's pushing a button. And uh, what he thought would occur is once the cat figured out how to do it, it would just always immediately go to the action that would open the door. So if you graphed the time to ex- uh, to escape each time you put the cat in the puzzle the puzzle box, you would expect to see each trial the time is high, and then once the cat figures it out, the time is almost zero. Um, similarly, he thought that if you allowed a cat to see another cat get out of a puzzle box, they would learn through imitation learning. And so he found none of those two things. What he found was this almost power law decay of oh, each time the cat got out of the cage, the time to get out the next time slowly decayed. In other words, he wasn't really having a notion of insight, but the cat was slowly becoming more likely to, to take the actions that would get it out of the, the cage. Okay. I mean, I will get to your question about uh, the limitation associated with learning, but this is a useful back backdrop. So, so the idea of this trial and error learning was was this law of effect, which is the way to get really clever, smart behaviors through trial and error. Is when something good happens, you just reinforce the prior behaviors. If something bad happens, you punish the prior behaviors. And this was an idea all the way from the early 1900s and the 1950s. Um, uh, Marvin Minsky tried to implement this exact algorithm in a computer. And so he tried to cha- uh, train a very simple sort of AI system to navigate out of mazes by strengthening the connections or the choices it made when it finally escaped from a maze. And what he found to his sort of surprise is it never got very smart um, because the strategy that Thorndike and, and most psychologists believed was the underlying algorithm by which trial and error occurs. When we tried to actually implement it, we ran into a wall. And the wall is something called the temporal credit assignment problem. Um, and I think this is, can be best understood in an example of like playing a game of checkers. So if we're playing a game of checkers and at the end you beat me, um, which prior moves should be reinforced to teach you how to play well the next time? In Edward Thorndike's incarnation, you would reinforce the moves right before you won. Um, but quite obviously, that's not necessarily a good strategy because the best moves that really won you the game could have occurred very early when you did something that took 12 of my pieces. And then the rest was mostly, you know, uh, you know, already a decided game, but we had to go through the motion before someone won. And so this is a catastrophic problem with learning through trial and error, which is you can't simply reinforce behaviors after a good outcome occurs because that doesn't assign credit um, to the right actions. And so this was a problem for for many, many uh, decades in AI. And this still occur in a nematode, for example, this associative learning has exactly this problem, which is one reason why nematodes are not particularly smart, which is they only assign these associations for things that directly overlap in time or things that occurred within a window of about two seconds afterwards. Um, for most invertebrates, not all, not the smart ones like arthropods, um, but many invertebrates, um, their window in which they make these types of associations is a matter of seconds. Um, so what's called trace conditioning doesn't last very long. Um, but if you look at vertebrates like fish, they can make very, very, they can implement very, very clever behaviors over much longer timescales. And so, uh, which um, Thorndike could obviously observe. So how, do, how does that actually work? What is the underlying algorithm? In the 1980s, this guy, Richard Sutton, came up with this, a very brilliant idea, um, which is now called temporal difference learning, where the way in which you can assign credit through trial and error is you actually have two systems. You have something called an actor, and the actor is looking at the current state and predicting the best next action, um, which is what most people thought of as the standard trial and error system. But then there's this other system called the critic, that looks at the current state and predicts how good the state is. So if we think about just playing a game of checkers, the actor looks at a board and predicts the next best move. The critic looks at a board and predicts what's the percentage chance I'm going to win. And so what you can do with this now is after every move um, the actor makes, the critic can now compare the difference, i.e. the temporal difference, 
and the likelihood of winning from the prior state to the current state. That difference can be used as a reinforcement signal. So if I do a move, for example, very early in the game that makes my probability of success go from 50% to 85%, I'm going to reinforce whatever action I just took. And if then at the very end of the game, my probability of winning goes from 99 to 100, I'm not going to reinforce that behavior that much because that didn't really make much of a difference. And so this sort of actor and critic playing back and forth where as we go, we have some internal expectation as to how close we are to a reward or how good or uh, how good of a move we just made is, that's the system by which we're actually reinforcing ourselves. So this was his theory. Um, several years later, this was actually tried in practice and teaching a game to play an AI system to play backgammon. And this has now become, you know, a, a boon in reinforcement learning is using the, exactly this temporal difference learning. This is uh, used in even self-driving cars for systems to keep our cars in lanes. And so in the 90s, it was so that we know this works in AI systems um, and it solves the temporal credit assignment problem. In the 90s, it was found that dopamine responses in vertebrate brains, um, so this in, uh, includes fish, um, respond as a reinforcement signal exactly like we would predict in temporal difference learning, which is a sort of beautiful synergy between AI and neuroscience, um, where we know that dopamine is reinforcing. There's a whole decades of, of literature that shows if you activate dopamine neurons, people become more likely to create the behavior that, that they just did. But what we find is dopamine doesn't primarily get activated by actual rewards, i.e. winning a game. It gets activated when we think we just took an action that increases the likelihood of getting a reward. In other words, it's, it's truly a temporal difference learning signal. So, so that capability, the solution to the temporal credit assignment problem, is something we see emerge in early vertebrates, which unlocks you know, their ability to learn complex sequences of actions, which we see in fish. Um, it enabled them to grow complex sensory organs because now that they can learn to take complex sequence of actions, it makes it much more valuable to perceive complicated things in the world. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that's really what emerged with vertebrates and breakthrough two, which is this ability to learn through reinforcement using temporal uh, differences. In the book, you also uh, you also uh, describe uh, this story how AI and uh, neurobiology in that uh, case actually work together to uh, uh, even discover that what was uh, seen as a random dopamine sign is probably the implementation of this of this temporal di uh, difference learning and. <clears throat> This is one of the many examples in, in the book uh, where it, uh, these two areas in, inform and influence each other. And now that we are, we have arrived at the second breakthrough with the reinforcement learning, you have found that it actually uh, created lots of new skills. And one of the surprising themes of this book is that uh, a lot of uh, skills have been discovered and observed with fish. Can you talk a bit more about that? <laughs> yes, so there's there's a very strong bias in um, animal psychology by no fault of animal psychologists, but there's a bias towards studying certain animals. Uh, so, for example, the vast majority of our uh, animal psychology research is done on mammals. And there's a reason for this because um, we are interested in things that affect humans. So most of the funding goes towards studying animals that have brains similar to ours, which tend to be mammals. Um, but this creates a bias in the literature towards, um, you know, studying the abilities of lots of mammals, but we don't really, there's not been a lot of research on, um, non-mammalian vertebrates with pro possibly the exception of birds. Um, which, which introduces another bias, which is we tend to only study animals that we deem particularly intelligent. Um, so this also makes it harder to observe sort of with a broad, unbiased brush, what do whole groups of animals or clads of animals or families of animals, uh, what are they capable of doing? So you kind of, so, so when trying to assess what early vertebrates were capable of, the studies of birds and mammals are not really good metrics for that because birds independently became very intelligent and have brains that don't look anything like the very first vertebrates or don't look much like the first vertebrates. And that's quite true uh, with mammals who have unique brain structures. But fish are a great case study because um, they have brains also that are still unique in their own ways. 
um, but are believed to be quite similar in many ways to what the brains of early vertebrates um, uh, looked like. So, so studying what we know about the intelligence of fish uh, is very useful in trying to back into what abilities um, were probably present uh, in early vertebrates. Now, this is not without errors because it's possible, of course, over the over 500 million years that fish independently garnered abilities. So there's lots we need to do to, to, to make sure that what we're observing in a given fish species is present in a sort of broad swath of them. So all that being said, um, studying fish intelligence is useful. And so popular culture has this view that fish are just really dumb and that we can't remember things. Fish can't remember things beyond three seconds. Um, and it's really interesting to read what we do know about fish intelligence because it just violates all of these sort of uh, societal prejudices against fish. Um, you can a fish can learn how to escape a, a pretty relatively complicated maze and remember it a year later without having been tested throughout that year. Um, fish can learn through trial and error how to pass through a complex sequence of uh, sort of transparent barriers, which is even a study that Thorndike did. Uh, he mentioned in a passing note in one of his um, books uh, that he tried the same thing on fish. Um, and uh, fish can recognize really complicated objects that we don't think of as intelligent, but we now know using, as we've tried to build these things in AI systems, is a really remarkable feat. For example, um, there have been studies where you can teach a fish to uh, swim towards one of two pictures of an object. So imagine a picture of a frog and a picture of a snail. And you can train them to always swim towards the frog to get some food. And if you make it so they've only seen the frog in a given orientation, so the picture is always, let's say, from above or from a certain angle of the side, and then for the first time ever, you show the fish uh, the picture of the same object but rotated in three-dimensional space. So they've never seen this object from this angle before. In AI, we know that's a very challenging problem. In order to train convolutional neural networks, so vision systems, to recognize objects despite rotations in 3D space, you need to give it a ton of training data of similar objects rotated in 3D space. It doesn't do a good job one shot identifying the same object rotated. But fish do that effortlessly. Um, they immediately identify the same object. You can train certain fish to recognize the same human face despite being rotated. So object detection is is really, really good in fish and seemingly as good on, on many dimensions as it is in humans and mammals. Um, so fish are clearly quite smart. They can learn complex sequences of behaviors, in other words, escaping mazes, getting through uh, um, sort of their own version of puzzle boxes, remembering that over long periods of time. Uh, they can recognize complex objects. Um, there's uh, some really interesting studies on interval timing. So you can't train a nematode that event A occurs exactly five seconds after event B. Um, it, doesn't, it does not have the mechanisms in its brain to uh, uh, represent the passage of time. But a fish can be trained to listen to a tone and exactly five seconds later do some action. Um, so it's very clear that they have some representation of time. Fish also have representation of space. So the common studies that have been done on mammals have also been tried on fish where you take a, a tank um, and you have a grid of five, five by five, so 25 canisters. And on one side of this tank, let's say you put a little marking, let's say like a blue marking. So, uh, you know, wherever the fish starts in the tank, it is theoretically possible to look at the wall of the tank and identify what side you're on, right? So there's some marking of, let's say, north on the tank. And if you, let's say, put food under one of the 25 sort of canisters um, or containers, um, no matter where you place the fish, once it learns this, it'll always go directly towards the same one. And we know it's not detecting any smell because if you clean out the entire tank and you put them all and you put all the canisters back without any food, so there's no smell to possibly detect, the fish will still go back no matter where you place in the tank to the exact location where there was food. What that undisputably shows is that fish have some representation of space in their mind. They have a cognitive map that they're using to locate it because there is no cue on this canister to tell it other than the cue on the wall from which it triangulated the right location in space. So these are all like very complicated feats um, that we see not only in fish, we see them in turtles, we see them in reptiles. So we know these are almost definitely things that were present in early vertebrates. And this is also one of the uh, the cases where we have 
skills which sound quite different like pattern recognition and map of space and they seem to have uh, all the same origin of reinforcement learning if i understand it correctly yeah so so um the vertebrate sort of reinforcement learning agent comes with some special features that we don't often model in ai systems but it's still all part of one sort of whole where in order you, in order to have a system that learns through trial and error it needs to perceive states of the world so it needs some pattern recognition module um, and pattern recognition isn't that useful unless you can use all of these new states you're learning um, so in order for pattern recognition to be useful you need some system that's going to learn to take actions on the basis of that um, the reason a cognitive map is useful is, uh, and I have, I talk a little bit about this in one of my, my papers where, you know, if all you were learning was the sequence of egocentric actions, in other words, when I see this cue, I always swim forward, whatever direction I'm facing and then turn right some angle and then swim forward a little bit. It's actually much harder to model than when I hear this cue, I just need to direct myself towards a location in space um, uh, some distance ahead of me. And so it, it simplifies what you're learning through reinforcement if you model things allocentrically, in other words, um, in external uh, reference frame of space as opposed to egocentrically. Um, but that doesn't represent, so this is a key line, which is part of sort of the insights from going through these breakthroughs. It doesn't mean that what they're actually doing is any form of planning. So it doesn't mean they're simulating possible future states. It just means that the action they're taking is represented not as go forward, but go north um, or go north relative to the allocentric frame of reference of the tank I'm in. Um, and so it's still it's still sort of a, a base form of I get a state and I just decide an action. There's no quote unquote cognitive process of planning per se, um, but there is a representation of space. And what's really cool is this sort of sets the stage for Breakthrough 3 because Breakthrough 3 doesn't work unless there is some mechanism for representing space, which we know exists in, in vertebrates. Um, but yes, they're all part of one whole. And you can see how they all emerge from a feedback loop that occurred in the Cambrian explosion in which vertebrates evolved, where you know for each innovation, a predator evolved. It was more pressure for a prey to get better at avoiding getting caught and that the better prey got at avoiding getting caught, the more pressure there was for predators to get better at catching them. So you get that feedback loop amongst the prey, which which our ancestors were primarily in the Cambrian. Um, we were small sort of fish getting hunted by arthropods. Um, you can see there's this feedback loop between the better pattern recognition system you have, the more pressure there is to learn to be able to more flexibly respond to new types of patterns you're learning, and the more flexible your sort of reinforcement learning, trial and error learning system you have, the more pressure there is to recognize even better and more flexible patterns in the world. Um, so you can learn more things in response to them. And you get that sort of feedback loop from which the vertebrate brain template evolved. Yes. And another connected phenomenon, which uh, I would have never thought of, but made absolutely sense when I read that, was that uh, one of these was uh, is also connected to better sensory skills. Because if you can generate patterns and have a bigger repertoire of actions, then it suddenly makes sense to uh, see and smell and hear more, more of the world around. And I probably even uh, also connected to the bigger motor repertoire, which we see at vertebrates that now that we see so many different patterns, so many different actions can evolve for this. And one more, uh, the closing chapter of this section is also something which fit, fits into, uh, into this whole thought is the curiosity that, that this also became valuable thanks to the evolutionary changes and to re reinforcement learning. So there's a cool, this is another really cool sort of synergy between neuroscience and AI where... Um, you know, some, a, a, a very clear finding we have um, uncovered trying to build reinforcement learning agents to do even simple tasks, um, simple relative to, you know, what a, a real animal would do in the, in the real world, um, like play a, a video game. 
uh, we found that um, certain video games, reinforcement learning systems really struggle to play. Um, and even over you know astronomical amounts of trials, they don't get very good at them. And uh, what AI researchers have found is uh, one of the features of games that standard reinforcement learning systems do poorly on is the feature of sparse rewards. In other words, a game where um, the first real signal that you're on the right track is far away from the beginning are games that standard reinforcement learning agents don't do well. And the reason is because of something called the exploration exploitation dilemma, which is a very common theme we see in AI systems. Um, and in simple terms, what this means is let's say I've learned um, in, when I see this state, this is the right action to take, or this is an action that seems to have the highest reward given the prior rewards I've seen. Um, there's always a chance that there's actually a better action you could take. Um, and so there's always this question every moment in time, do I exploit what I know works or do I explore something new and try a, a, a new random action that maybe will yield something good? And so it used to be that standard reinforcement learning systems manage this exploration, exploit, uh, exploitation dilemma through randomness. Um, so it just have a parameter um, that would say something that would be like 0.05 and 0.05 just means 5% of the time I'm going to take a random action. And hopefully over time, that'll just help me fill out um, and learn the right rewards. But that only works in a world of non-sparse rewards, where from any moment in time, when you take a random action, you're likely to find the actual good thing you should have done. With sparse rewards, if you're just doing a random action locally, you may never find the reward some you know unit of time away. So what they found is the way to solve this problem is actually to make reinforcement learning systems inherently curious. And by curiosity, what we mean is we want to do things and explore things we have not explored before. So if you have a map now and you put one of these agents in the map, AI agents in a map, uh, and you imbue them with curiosity, in other words, they get re a reward from trying something new or going some to some new place, all of a sudden they start exploring. But it's not random. It's much smarter than random because they don't try and go back to some place they've already seen. So they don't end up sort of wasting time randomly doing an action they've already done. Um, instead, they're intentionally uh, exploring and expanding the scope of what they have seen um, until they eventually un uncover um, this sparse reward. And then they can shift from being intrinsically motivated, in other words, motivated just by an internal desire to explore and be curious, to extrinsically motivated to actually obtain the reward. And this is a very clever way to, to manage the exploration exploitation dilemma. And so it is fascinating to observe that the first in our evolutionary lineage that we see the first time we see the real emergence of curiosity in the sense of an explicit desire to explore net new things um, is with early vertebrates which is exactly when we see reinforcement learning emerge um, if you put a new object in a tank of a fish the fish will expend energy going over to it sniffing it understanding it until it feels satisfied that it understands it and then it will swim away um, and you don't see this with the nematodes. Um, now there is a, you could argue this is where the Mars framework of like computation versus algorithm is an important distinction. Um, you could argue that adaptation, which means that, uh, nematodes become less likely to respond to a stimulus that's repeated in, implements a really basic form of curiosity because a new smell that's emerged um, is more likely to get a response from a nematode than a smell that's been there for 60 minutes because neurons just adapt. So this is perhaps a uh, very primitive version of what you might call curiosity, but algorithmically it's nothing like what we mean by curiosity in AI systems. And what we mean by curiosity in AI systems maps very clearly to what we mean by curiosity in vertebrates. But but yeah, curiosity was a key um, a key innovation. And it's it's I find beautiful the synergies between the way it seems to be implemented in uh, mm -hmm. vertebrate brains and the way we do it in AI systems. Mm -hmm. And you have already touched on the next breakthrough, uh, both into an introduction and here, that uh, with the appearance of mammals, the neocortex uh, appeared, and it made the, the skill of simulation possible, which also uh, manifested in multiple different behaviors, which 
we would probably not think about a similar at the first sight. Yeah. So with, um, you know, there's a very rich history of um, exploring, you know, cognitive maps or, uh, you know, the planning uh, that occurs within um, rats and, and other forms of mammals. And it's been very controversial for a very long time. So Edward Tolman, um, you know, I think it was in the 40s even, hypothesized that rats were capable of, of thinking about possible futures. And he hypothesized this just by observing rats navigate through mazes. And he found that when they would reach choice points, so moments when uh, the right choice was not obvious, um, sometimes rats would pause and it would toggle its head back and forth and then make a choice. So he sort of anthropomorphized and projected on it that like, oh, they're thinking about possible options. And of course, this became the sort of cognitive versus behavioral schism in psychology. And he was arguing there was a cognitive process and other people were saying, no, it's just trial and error learning. That's you're not. Yeah, that's what you're what you think the rat is doing is not actually what it's doing. And so this was sort of a debate, unsolved debate for a long time. Um uh, at least the, the vicarious trial and error part was unsolved um, until the early 2000s when David Reddish's lab um, did a study. And I, in the interest of time, won't go through all the details, but effectively you can go into a rat brain and you can see it planning its future um, directly. So you can record neurons in the hippocampus, um, which activated certain locations in a maze. And when the when a rat pauses to toggle its head back and forth, you can literally see in its brain it imagining possible futures before making a choice. So it's very hard to argue. There's a few holdout neuroscientists that still would make this argument, but I find it uh, very hard to defend the claim that rats are incapable of imagining possible futures because we can literally watch it occurring. Um, so most people um, have conceded that. And so what's really cool is the the sort of brain systems by which they implement this is present in all mammals. Like it's, you see in rats, we see this vicarious trial and error in humans, we see it in monkeys. Um, and uh, effectively what's happening is uh, the neocortex, which is a part of the brain uh, that, you know, there's some evidence uh, implements what's called a generative model, um, which is a model that's trained by self-supervision. So it tries to predict its input and trains itself through errors and how good it is at predicting its own input, um, effectively creates this model of the world. Um, and what's magical about this model of the world is it can it can imagine states that are not the current one. So a rat now can pause and now can explore in its neocortex, what would happen if I turned left? And the neocortex will represent what going left looks like and it will keep doing that um, until it goes back and forth and decides in its simulation of the future in the neocortex which outcome occurred that I like the most. Um, and then it will take that action. And so the same algorithm of a generative model rendering a simulation can be done to project forward. So vicarious trial error. And as I said, you could also do the same exact thing to project backwards, so episodic memory, or imagine possible past actions. And all three of these things have been shown across broad swaths of, of mammals. And one interesting skill, uh, thing about this skill is that it appeared and it seems to be present in all mammals, but it looks like it isn't being used all the time. And here is where uh, you mentioned that this might be the biological basis for what Kahneman and Tversky labeled the system one and system two. Yeah, there's this other, um, you know, really cool uh, synergy between neuroscience, psychology, and AI when we reach this point in evolution. And they all use different nomenclature to refer to largely the same thing. So in psychology, um, this has been now famously denoted system one or system two. So system one is sort of fast thinking. Um, it's knee jerk reactions to things. So as I walk down the street, I'm not thinking about how I place my feet. As I speak right now, I'm not thinking about the placement of my mouth and my lips to make these noises. These are all system one. They're sort of unconscious automated behaviors. System two is when we pause to actually think about um, what Daniel Kahneman will call slow thinking. Um, when we pause to think about our steps and reason through things. And so they each have their pros and cons. System one um, is really fast, but it can be inaccurate. System two is slow, but more accurate. And so, you know, humans we know in psychology are toggle between these two things. And 
many of our cognitive biases and irrational behaviors emerge from not toggling between them at the right moments um, because evolution has decided that we don't want everything to be system two because we would never be able to walk down the street because we would be thinking about moving all the time. So we need to automate behaviors. And when we over automate or we accidentally automate something we shouldn't be automating, then then you get sort of irrational cognitive biases, et cetera. And that's sort of thinking fast and slow is a, a beautiful treatise and examples where when sometimes when we think fast, it leads to incorrect choices, percepts, et cetera. But this division between system two and system one doesn't only exist in psychology. Um, so in neuroscience, it's called goal-directed and habitual behavior because we see that we can lesion different parts of the brain and we get distinctions between these things where animals will habitually start doing things even though there is no clear goal. Um, and you can also damage habitual behavior and then they, they don't automate things. So they struggle to automate. So we know there's a division of the brain. In AI, the same exact concept is called model-free reinforcement learning, which is the version of system one, meaning by just automatically acting in response to a stimulus versus model-based reinforcement learning, um, which means system two. And the reason we use the term model-based versus model-free is in order to pause and imagine possible states that are not the current one, whether possible futures or past events, you need a model of the world so that you can predict the outcome of your actions correctly. Um, model free does not need a rich inner model of the world because I'm never pausing and saying, what would happen if I walked forward five feet, turned left five feet, and then did this thing? What would occur in the world? In order to ask that question and reliably get a, a, an answer, your brain needs to have some representation of the world that accurately captures how it works so you can predict the consequences of actions you've never actually taken before. So all, th all three of these fields have sort of stumbled on the same exact thing. And it's no surprise we've done that because this is a, a natural feature of, um, you know, how intelligence uh, uh, is likely to have to be implemented or probably the best forms of intelligence uh, end up being implemented in this way, um, where you need a system, uh, you need a system to pause and think. Um, in other words, simulate possible things to be more accurate, um, but you need some model free system um, to automate behaviors so that you're not wasting too much energy and computation time thinking. Um, and so we part of what makes mammals so smart um, and that we haven't yet figured out in AI systems is not the presence of model-based reinforcement learning, but the flexibility of that model-based reinforcement learning. In other words, um, being able to do this type of simulation in a complex, noisy, ever-changing world is something that mammals can do and AI systems still struggle at and toggling between these two things. So mammals are in general quite good at deciding when to pause and think and when to just keep going versus our AI systems, we don't have a good mechanism for teaching them or imbuing them with the skill of deciding when to stop and when not to. So for example, AlphaGo, which is a system, a model-based system that beat the best Go player in the world, it never it never decided whether or not to think about its future. Every single move, it simulated many, many possible futures, and then it would choose the best one, and it would do that every single time. But that can only work in a game of Go. If you sent that exact agent out into the world as it's walking down the street, it can't. It, then you have the problem of, well, I have to start automating things. So, yeah, that's just a, a quick summary of the the what I find it the sort of beautiful symmetry between uh, system one, system two, and things going on in the brain. Yes, and another aspect which I found very interesting in this chapter is where you introduce the cortex and you introduce the similar algorithms in very in very different functions of the cortex. Can you tell a bit about that? Yeah, so if you look at a human brain, almost everything you see is neocortex um, because the neocortex is this sort of uh, sheet like structure that's folded around the rest of the brain. And it gets, because our, um, our neocortex has grown over, especially primate evolution, it's become folded in our skull to like fit into the skull. So mo when you visualize a brain, most of what you're looking at is neocortex. And, um, the neocortex does very different things depending on the region or seems to do very different things depending on the region of neocortex you're referencing. So, for example, there's sort of a, a band uh, 
around the front of your neocortex called the motor cortex. And if you get a, if you get a stroke or, or damage to that, to an area of motor cortex, um, humans will become paralyzed. Um, similarly, uh, in the back of your neocortex is a place called part of the brain called the visual cortex. If that's damaged, you become blind. It's part of the neocortex called auditory cortex. If that gets damaged, you can lose the ability to perceive and understand sounds. There's a part of the neocortex that seems to control language production, so you can lose the ability to speak. Um, there's a part of the brain, uh, the neocortex, um, that seems to be uh, involved in the perception of space. So if a certain region gets damaged, uh, you will get um, uh, a, a syndrome where you can't perceive things in the left side of your uh, visual sort of perception um, or the right side of your visual perception. So when you look at all this in totality, um, it just looks like, even though the, it would it would seem to suggest that the neocortex, although it looks similar, um, really is doing different things. Um, so it, maybe it's not really just one big structure. Um, but when you look at the neocortex under a microscope, it looks the same everywhere um, with like very minor distinctions. For the most part, it looks like one homogenous structure. The only difference being what inputs and outputs goes to given regions. So the visual cortex gets inputs from the eyes. Um, the auditory co cortex gets inputs from the ears, so on and so forth. Uh, but the cortexes themselves don't look that different. And so this again goes to this Mars three levels thing, which is even though the computations might be different, um, in other words, representing imagery versus motor movements, it looks like the algorithm is somehow the same because uh, when we look at what's actually going on in the neocortex, we don't see something that looks very different in visual cortex versus auditory cortex. There's also been studies that show these are actually interchangeable. There's some really cool studies that reroute uh, input from the eye, from the eyes to auditory cortex in certain mammals, like ferrets, as was done in ferrets, and auditory cortex just learns to recognize images. So there's nothing inherently auditory, but auditory cortex just happens to be the input, I guess. And so this guy, Vernon Mountcastle, famously proposed um, in the 70s that that maybe actually there's this thing called the neocortical microcircuit or cortical column that is just a repetition of the same algorithm over and over and over again. Um, and the only difference is the input it gets. And so this is still, you know, there's still some controversy as to how true this is, but um, by and large, there's... Um, a lot of evidence for this, and there's a lot of uh, excitement in the neuroscience community around this idea that the neocortex is implementing this like general intelligence algorithm, um, and it's just repeated a bunch of times. And so, of course, there's a lot of interest in the AI community in reverse engineering what is this algorithm, and we to this day don't know. But there's good evidence; it's in the class of models called generative models, which I was talking about prior, which learns to represent its input and tries to predict away its own input. Um, so it learns through what's called self-supervision, which interestingly, almost all or many of the successes of AI in the last few years have all come from this exact same approach of self-supervision. Um, in other words, uh, systems trained to predict its own input. Um, and so, you know, there's some evidence for that idea. But but yeah, what, what's fascinating about the neocortex is it functionally seems distinct, but under the when we look at the actual algorithms being implemented, it seems to be the same. So let's continue with the next breakthrough, which almost sounds logical after simulating becoming mentalizing, which I mentioned with the early primates. Yeah, so um, the primate brain uh, looks quite similar structurally to other mammal brains, with the exception of a few neocortical regions, which uh, seem to be uniquely primate. And these neocortical regions are highly implicated in uh, feats like theory of mind. Um, so there's a lot of really good evidence that uh, one of the key things that emerge in early primates is what I call mentalizing um, uh, the ability, or what's often called metacognition. So the ability to think about thinking itself. Um, and one could also think about this as being able to simulate other simulations. So being able to imagine yourself in another situation and pose the question, what would I be thinking about? Or what would I be simulating in that situation? And so that's a very useful ability if you're in a highly social um, sort of feedback loop, which you, know, you can look at primate societies and see that they're in a very political um, 
a very political lifestyles where your reproductive success is determined by your placement in a social hierarchy and your placement in a social hierarchy is determined by your ability to politic. In other words, build alliances with the right people, um, befriend the right people, intimidate the right people. And so the more we've learned about these primate societies, we see all of this really clever sort of deception, counter deception, um, trying to understand the preferences and intents of other people. It's almost like the worst version of middle school life. This, this is how I <laughs> I describe it. Um, so the uh, so there's a lot of there's some good evidence that mentalizing was uh one of the key things that primates garnered the ability to do, and this enabled them to engage in theory of mind. There's um, still some controversy, should be said, but uh, I find the evidence quite compelling that uh, many primates can infer the intent and knowledge of other uh, humans and other uh, non-human primates. There are lots of studies that demonstrate that. There's also a recent study that came out that demonstrated not only are they capable of doing that, but if you inhibit specifically the areas of the neocortex that evolved from early primates, they lose the ability to do that. So that demonstrates a causal relationship between the new primate areas and the new capability of theory of mind. And with mentalizing also comes other abilities, which goes to this really nice model of a new algorithm enabling multiple new uh, sort of emergent capacities. Uh, so imitation learning is another example. So this in AI, we we now have a good understanding of the ability to infer the intent of the skilled demonstrator that you're trying to learn from improves your performance a lot. Um, so, you know, and we know that non-human primates are very good imitation learners, so they can learn skills by watching other people perform skills uh, much better than non-primate mammals uh, or most non-primate mammals. And uh, the other one, which is probably the most uh, controversial in the sense that we haven't done enough studies to adjudicate um, adjudicate this, but there's some early evidence that also primates are uniquely good at anticipating their own future needs. In other words, um, you know, we go to the grocery store, but we're not hungry because we anticipate being hungry in the future. And uh, primates show signs of being able to do these types of things, whereas non most non primate mammals, um, it's doesn't it doesn't seem clear that they can do the same thing. So you do see things like rats. Um, or, 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 or mice hoard for the winter, but they've th we've shown um, experimentally that uh, that behavior is actually reflexive behavior. So if you lower the temperature um, in a cage with a, a mouse that's never experienced hunger in the winter before, they immediately start hoarding food. In other words, dropping temperatures just triggers a sort of reflexive behavior. So we see so we're anticipating future needs. Um, imitation learning and theory of mind emerge from this new cognitive ability, which is just uh, being able to uh, mentalize or, or think about thinking. And this is the chapter where you are talking not just about how these capabilities inform us to build better AI models, but also that how these some of these primate properties inform us which mistakes not to repeat in AI models. And you talk often about not to re rebuild a human a uh, way of thinking whole self. Can you perhaps elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. So primates are, um, you know, from the politicking sort of societies of non-human primates also emerges, you know, certain features of humanity that we probably don't want to replicate. For example, you know, uh, the desire to be status seeking, um, in grouping and out grouping. Um, so, you know, non-human primates can be very territorial. They have their group and people outside of the group, they don't want anywhere near them. Um, there've been examples of non-human primates waging war, going out of their way to sort of punish someone who leaves the group and, and, and harm them physically. And so, um, I think it's important to note that studying the human brain and studying the evolution of, of human intelligence uh, the fruit of that labor is not to wholesale copy the human brain. The fruit of that labor is understanding deeply how human intelligence works. So we can, of our own volition, decide which features of these things do we want to recreate and which features of these things do we not want to recreate. So we almost certainly don't want AI systems that are domineering, that seek status, that want, a, that want power. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are things that we see very clearly amongst primate, uh, many primates, not all. Um, that we almost certainly don't want to replicate. So, so yeah, it's important to note that not everything we want to copy from the human brain. Mm 
Thanks a lot. I think that is a great closing. Uh, thanks so much for your time and thanks a lot for listening. I would definitely encourage everyone to check out the book and there you can also find the fifth breakthrough, which we didn't talk about, which is speaking. Uh, and also a lot of really cool illustrations to show this concept much better than we could do in this conversation. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me.